Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. My name is Rob Reich. I'm the faculty director of the Center for Ethics in Society, which is the host of the event tonight. I teach and write about moral and political philosophy here at Stanford. When I showed up at college about 35 years ago, I had never before taken a philosophy class. I had some assumptions, however, about the subject. Theoretical, abstract, and irrelevant ideas in long and dense books chiefly provided to us by old men with white beards who had also been dead for a long time. Likely very boring. And then I took a philosophy class in my first year, and the first thing we read was Plato's Symposium, which I didn't know until I'd read it as a short dialogue, just uh, 20 or 30 pages, where Socrates and his friends sit around a dinner table drinking a bunch of wine, talking about what love is. And I thought to myself, I'm interested in that topic. Then I read Aristotle, and he had a whole series of letters to um, various people to try to explain the nature of friendship. And reflecting on what Aristotle had written, I thought to myself, I need to become a better friend. I relearned what I thought friendship was. And I read uh, someone I eventually actually met, Susan Muller Oaken, a philosopher who taught here at Stanford, who said that a just society would be one without gender. Her project was, she said, to eliminate gender entirely, by which she meant in its social structures and practices, one's sex would have no more relevance to one's chances in life than one's eye color or the length of one's toes. That sounded interesting too, but what did that mean? So I found myself thinking about philosophy for a good part of the day, good part of the night. In fact, I decided love, friendship, thinking about the role of gender in society. These were amongst the most relevant things I could be thinking and studying about. And even better, reading and doing philosophy was fun because philosophy is done best in dialogue. It involves play and curiosity. It's an excuse to remain childlike and inquisitive. And debating the meaning of life with your roommate at beer, uh, oh, at midnight with beer, sometimes felt like studying for class the next day. So I decided that I wanted to major in philosophy, but I worried that my parents wouldn't be happy with this. So I made an office hour appointment with one of my philosophy professors who was out of central casting, an old guy with a long white beard. I told him I needed some advice. What should I tell my parents? And he stooped over and in a very low voice said, there is no good reason to major in philosophy. <laughs> <laughs> I went ahead anyway, and through an extraordinary series of lightning strikes and good fortune in my life, I'm still doing philosophy. I can't believe my good fortune that I now get paid to teach and write about it here at Stanford. Now, I think if only Michael Shore's The Good Place had been around then, I would have just told my parents to watch that. Michael Schur's show and his recent book, How to Be Perfect, The Correct Answer to Every Moral Question, have done a lot to popularize philosophy. And it's a thrill to welcome him to campus. The format for this evening, Michael Schur will be in conversation with Ashwin Pillai, an undergraduate here at Stanford who is completing an honors thesis in ethics and society. Shur and Pillai will be introduced by an amazing Stanford undergraduate named Gwendolyn Spencer. So hold on to your seats just a moment while I tell you a bit about Gwen. Gwen is a first year student here, a freshman. Parks and Rec is one of her favorite shows. She has posters of Burt Macklin and Janet Snakehole on her walls at home. And I have it on good authority from her mother that she brought them with her here to her dorm room on campus. I asked her mother to tell me a bit about Gwen and she told me, as a kid, she watched so much TV that I said something like, Gwen, I hope you become a screenwriter, or else I'm going to look back and feel really bad about how much TV I let you watch. Well, it seems to be coming to pass. Gwen has written several pilot screenplays, including one called Rat Race, about four high school juniors, Outcasts and Best Friends, and a more recent pilot for a show called What's the Worst Thing That Could Happen? a 30-minute mockumentary about a family confronting a devastating illness and how sor sorrowful and yet joyful chaos ensues. They navigate their comically tragic reality through the power of human connection. Stories can teach, 
and stories can heal. Ladies and gentlemen, remember this name. Please welcome Gwendolyn Spencer. Hi, everyone. I'm Gwendolyn. Legends from smoke and stone mark the beginning of storytelling. Soon, smoke turned to bonfire, turned to hearth, turned to LED candle. However the flame was fueled, humans burned for story. And for as long as I can remember, I felt that yellow-orange hug. I was a moth drawn to tempting light. It first flickered when my dad generated the lore of Bob the Unicorn, who is an ice cream devouring magical being, and then again the first time we laughed at the office together. Dad held the match and spark. All I needed was kindling for my writerly flames to burst. This feels very surreal right now, and I'm sort of geeking out a little bit, um, because the person I'm about to introduce you all to has created my most favorite TV shows of all time, even all of the ones that I watched in my childhood. Um, and I know what you're thinking. Everyone loves The Office, and Parks and Recreation, and The Good Place, and Brooklyn Nine-Nine. Well, what if I told you that I have watched The Office with my dad nearly seven times over now? <laughs> um, and I'm not a math person, but I did think it would be a good idea to see how much time we have actually spent watching The Office. This was a terrible idea, and I very much regret it. <laughs> Um, the total number of hours it takes to get through one run-through of The Office is 74 hours. That's three days. <laughs> the total number of hours it takes to get through The Office seven times is 518 hours, <laughs> which is 21 days, and that is three weeks. <laughs> <laughs> so keep in mind, this also doesn't count the five rewatches of Parks and Rec or the two I did of The Good Place. So it's safe to say that I've been a fan for a while, or for at least three weeks. <laughs> In all seriousness, though, these works are more than just a show to my family. They're a language, a connective fabric that never stretches too thin. These shows, Michael Scher's work, have held my family above water when we felt like we were drowning. When I came to terms with my bisexuality via purple hair, my dad was diagnosed with ALS in 2020. My world shattered to pieces. I looked down at the jagged shards, and in the ruin I saw wisecracks and dad jokes. I saw my dad chuckle when Ron and April share their disdain for social and human interaction, and when Chidi couldn't make a decision between Froyo flavors. It was then I, needed, I knew that I needed to help people find levity and tragedy like Michael Schur had done for me, an antidote of laughter and love. Whoosh, a burst of red and yellow, the smell of ghost stories and s'mores, a raging fire. My calling, the aforementioned light my moth brain loved so very much, was to tell stories for people whose lives had become a collection of glass like mine. I wanted to show people how to make mosaics out of that glass. I wanted to amplify the voices of fellow queer teens, of mourning families, and to honor the voice who had told me that a unicorn was responsible for dessert theft. A lick and run, if you will. Uh, <laughs> and I know I wanted to make them laugh, like the office had made my dad and I laugh, even through our tears. I would give the gift of giggle through the form of screenplay. Needless to say, Michael Schur and his work have been an incredibly important backdrop to my life and to many others too. He is insightful and witty, clever and playful. He has been nominated for 19 Primetime Emmy Awards and is a two-time winner. Schur has created gloriously t funny TV shows like The Good Place, along with co-producing Parks and Rec and Brooklyn Nine-Nine and writing for The Office. And in addition to his behind-the-screen roles, Schur has also appeared in numerous acting roles. You might remember him as elusive and eccentric Cousin Mose or Doug Forsett. Michael Schur is the epitome of fantastic comedy writing and has broken into the world of prose recently with his book, How to Be Perfect, The Answer to Every Moral Question. The book makes this nearly impossible to reason with an, uh, topic accessible and enjoyable with conversational tone and sprinkles of Schur's trademark humor. And if you're wondering, yes, this book will in fact answer every single moral quandary you have ever had or ever will have for the rest of eternity and also beyond. And another fabulous person I'd like to introduce you all to is Ashwin Pillai, who will be facilitating our conversation later today. He is a student in ethics and society and studying philosophy and political science. 
He is currently writing his thesis on the standing doctrine and the difficulty of bringing legal cases against institutional systems. But for now, without further ado, the man, the myth, the comedy legend, Michael Schur. So much stuff on this. Like, what is this connected to? Does anyone, <laughs> anyone need this right now? No, okay, good. Um, hi, everyone. <clears throat> a few months ago, I was doing an interview for the book with a reporter from Europe. Uh, I don't want to say exactly where he was from, but he, he lived in a sort of netherland. <laughs> and he was very charming, this guy, and he had this sort of characteristically blunt Northern European approach to his questions, which I like very much. And after the usual, you know, how did you get interested in this subject? How did a TV writer end up dabbling in philosophy? He asked me this. He said, you have written a book which tells us how to be good people, but there are so many terrible, terrible people in the world, and none of them are trying at all to be good, and many of them are very rich and successful. So what is the point? <laughs> and I was sort of taken aback. Most of the interviews I had done to that point did not include a moment where the interviewer asked me if my book and the entire project of the last five years of my life was a complete waste of time. <laughs> but it's a good question. I think it's a question that anyone in their right mind should be asking all the time. When it comes to ethics in the modern world, what the hell is the point? George Santos, uh, who li lied about every aspect of his entire life, including the way his own mother died, is a sitting US congressman representing 750,000 people from the wealthiest congressional district in New York State. So far, his punishment for lying about literally every aspect of his life, including the way his own mother died, has been not really anything, right? He's still a congressman. He's still hanging around Capitol Hill, you know, making laws. He is fine. In 2016, Wells Fargo Bank was found to have defrauded its customers so egregiously and thoroughly that they had to pay a $3 billion fine. Their CEO, who had the delightfully evil name of John Stumpf, resigned and received a $130 million severance package. Six years later, last year, 2022, Wells Fargo was found to have defrauded their customers so thoroughly and egregiously in an entirely different way that they had to pay another $1.7 billion fine. Their new CEO, Charles Scharf, who I'm pretty sure is just former CEO John Stumpf in a fake mustache, <laughs> made $25 million and kind of bragged in the press that he had not taken a raise, which I thought was lovely of him. <laughs> Mel Gibson is still making movies. Donald Trump is the front runner for the 2024 Republican nomination. It can frequently feel in the modern world that not only is acting ethically not required for success and power in this country, it might actually hinder one's ability to achieve success and power. Now, this is not saying that there are no consequences for bad actions. Recently, thanks to the determination of some very brave people, bad actors are being held to account in ways that they never were before. That's good. But it can still seem, from time to time, that the bad guys win. It can seem that if you behave ethically, you're a sucker. You're screwing yourself. You are diminishing your chances for success in your chosen field, and that in philosophical terms, sucks. <laughs> the question then becomes, what is the argument for being good, right? What's a winning argument for why we ought to try to act ethically whenever we can? I have a couple answers for you. I hope you find them convincing. You might not, but they're all I've got. The first is a tautology. Being good is better than being bad. As long as humans have had the ability to think about themselves, they have all come to this shocking conclusion, admittedly for different reasons. Some think it's better to be good than bad because it will afford you eternity in paradise. Some think it's better because humans, unique in the animal kingdom, 
have the ability to reason and thus actually determine what is good and what is bad. And if we have that ability, well, you know, what the hell, might as well go ahead and do the good thing instead of the bad thing. No matter your justification, we invented the concepts of good and bad for a reason, and that reason was to aim at the good. I offer you this self-evident statement for two reasons. First, because self-evident statements can sometimes serve as helpful reminders of things we learn when we're very young, but which fade over time, becoming blurry against a cascade of adult complexities and societal pressures. There is value in remembering something as basic and simple as being good is better than being bad. But more importantly, I offer it to you because it really makes me laugh to think that your parents paid $75,000 so that you could come to this lecture hall and hear the guy who played Moe's on The Office <laughs> tell you that being good is better than being bad. The second answer to the question, why should I act ethically if unethical ethical people seem to have a lot of success, is this. Perhaps the definition of success needs some sprucing up. This country is obsessed with tangible success. We track box office grosses. We give awards for art. We look at people singing beautifully and we think, ooh, maybe this could be a game show. When I was working on the show The Office, we had a problem, which is that the character Jim Halpert seemed to some of us in the writer's room like he was destined for bigger things than working at a paper company in Scranton, Pennsylvania. We developed a story arc where he was up for a job in New York City, and we wondered why he wouldn't take it if it were offered. And our showrunner, Greg Daniels, said, well, not everyone wants to move to New York and take a bigger job. Some people just want to stay in their hometown and ask the person they like if they'd like to have dinner. It wasn't a shocking revelation or anything, but many years later when I read Aristotle's ethics, his words came back to me. A successful life might simply mean a happy life. Now, I'm not naive. I understand that no one can be truly happy unless they feel safe, and safety often comes from tangible things. But as Aristotle wrote 24 centuries ago, there are things we do in order to get something else, right? We work in order to get money. We exercise in order to get stronger. There are also good things we want, like partnerships or friendships, so that we can be happy. But happiness is the ultimate thing that we want. It's the final goal for all of us. And for Aristotle, that came from virtue. Specifically, precise amounts of characteristics like generosity and mildness and courage. And for him, the lifelong search for those precise amounts is the only path to happiness. Admittedly. Aristotle's argument is kind of a tough sell. Your friend says he wants a better job so he can make more money and buy a cool speedboat with flames painted on the sides, and you have to be like, speedboats, cool, but you know what's really cool is embarking on a search for the precise amount of temperance. <laughs> huh? Fun, right? This is only to say that these tangible markers of success, like wealth and power and fame and promotion, might help in basic ways to get us closer to happiness, but they also might not. Or maybe they'll help to some degree, but not to the utter exclusion of everything else in life. I would also add that success, happiness, these things are not binary. It is rarely the case that we are either happy or unhappy, and correspondingly, it is normally not the case that actions are purely good or purely bad, purely successful or purely unsuccessful. I have learned to think of the things I do not as good or bad, but as better or worse. The search for goodness for the right thing to do is rarely simple. Occasionally, you're going to get an easy one, right? Should you use that new weird AI chatbot thing to write your economics paper? No, you obviously should not. Should you hold the door open for an old man carrying two arm loads full of groceries? Yes, you obviously should. But most of the time, the world of ethics is gray and muddy. Your friend will tell you a nasty rumor she heard about your roommate, but your roommate is a little fragile right now because their dad is sick, and if you tell your roommate about the rumor, it might cause them undue stress, but if you don't, they might be unknowingly stigmatized, and also the person who told you the rumor is kind of a drama queen, let's face it. I mean, we all know how that person could be, and so is this rumor even true? And the question remains, do you tell your roommate that this rumor is circulating? And to that, I would say, I don't know. Why are you asking? I just got here. Like, don't drag me into your weird roommate psychodrama. 
So when you're faced with one of those tangled ethical webs, eventually you're just gonna have to make a call. And that call might lead to a bad outcome. That does not mean you were not successful in your attempt to be good. It might just mean that there was no right or wrong, just slightly better or slightly worse, and you accidentally stumbled ass backwards into slightly worse. The search for virtue is as important as the virtue itself. And success in this case might mean, how hard did you try to tease out the right answer? How many tools did you use? How sincere was your effort? What can you do better in the future? With ethics, just like cross-country road trips or marriage or college, the journey is often the destination. The third answer I can give you, or that journalist in answer to the question, what the hell is the point, came from a friend of mine. We are discussing one of the questions I raise in my book, which is, are you supposed to return your shopping cart to that weird little shopping cart corral thingy when you're done unloading the groceries in your car, or can you just leave the shopping cart in the parking lot? I ran through three or four philosophical arguments making this point or that point, and then he said, you know, here's the thing, man. When I return it to the corral thingy, I feel good about myself, and when I don't, I don't feel good about myself. That may just be the best answer I can give you. Perhaps the question that matters most here is, how do my actions make me feel about myself? Now, this assumes we are being honest with ourselves, of course, and can make an honest assessment of how we feel, but assuming we can, the self-image of a person who tries whenever she can to do the slightly better thing instead of the slightly worse thing is bound to improve. Or at least that self-image will hold steady against a seemingly endless tide of external forces aiming to degrade it. When the ancient Greeks wanted to distill their worldview into its simplest form, they chiseled three pithy statements into stone. Know thyself, nothing in excess, surety brings ruin. In the modern parlance, understand who you are and what you believe. Be moderate in your thoughts and actions. Don't be so sure you're right that you forget to contemplate the possibility that you are wrong. When it comes to teaching people how to act and think and feel, I'm not sure we've come up with a better philosophy in the ensuing 2,500 years. I'm not sure anyone will ever come up with a better philosophy of life or goodness or the search for virtue. But I wholeheartedly encourage all of you with your big, juicy brains, spending your formative years at one of the world's greatest universities to try. Thank you. I'm sorry I'm, I'm sniffly. I, I'm on day 38 of a cold. It will not leave me. I apologize. Oh, hello, Mr. Schur. Thank you so much Mike, for your... Mike, 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 please. Sorry? I feel so old. You have no idea how old I feel. <laughs> Just Mike. Don't... Mr. Schur sounds like grandpa to me. <laughs> all right. Well, hello, Mike. Thank you so much for the fantastic Hi, Ashwin. remarks. Thank you. And for coming all the way down here to Stanford. Um, my first question for you. In How to Be Perfect, you consider several moral theories that span literally thousands of years, and you, you describe philosophers as engaging in this long, ongoing conversation with each other about what it means to be a good person. So in your opening remarks, you talked about why someone should want to be a good person. And I'm wondering, for those of us who have now been convinced, what do you think it is that makes being a morally good person so difficult? And is there anything unique about the modern world that makes this even more complicated? Uh, I. <clears throat> I think that the entire modern world is essentially rigged against the concept of goodness. Um, not everywhere, perhaps, but in, I would say, in Western industrialized nations, the temptation to do the slightly worse thing instead of the slightly better thing is nearly constant. And so part of the, part of the struggle, the frustration, the anguish comes from... <clears throat> a general sense that you are exerting more effort, spending more time, spending perhaps more money, and, and, uh, and achieving something that's barely measurable, right? Like it, it, if you're talking about a simple consumer choice, should I buy uh, organic uh, chicken instead of non-organic chicken? If your organic chicken costs more, um, your understanding of the benefits are, 
of it are, is muddy. You don't even really know for sure. You're, you're, sold a, you're sold an image, right, of like a happy chicken roaming on a prairie somewhere and just living its best chicken life. Like this chicken was, it was so happy and it had a bunch of chicken friends and they hung out and they, they spent time together and they laughed and they cried. And then at the end of this chicken's beautiful, perfect life, it said, I am ready. And then the chicken was humanely uh, killed. And in its dying thoughts, it said, I have, I have fulfilled my chicken destiny. <laughs> you don't know if that's true. Like there, it, all, it, it just says organic on it. That's all you know. And for all you know, the packages were switched in a mistake at the chicken processing plant. And so it, it takes more thought and time and energy to do the slightly better thing. And you don't, it, it's not like when you, I, I became a vegetarian like 12 years ago. And part of the reason I became a vegetarian is I read that it's the single biggest thing that anyone can do to help in the fight against climate change, right? It's just stop eating meat, eat less meat. The, the way in which meat is produced in this country is a terrible contributor to climate change. Great. I stopped eating meat. I haven't had, I've had red meat accidentally twice in the last dozen years. The, how the world is still getting hotter, right? Like I didn't solve it. And so at a certain point, you are tempted in these decisions to think like, well, did this do anything? Like, did it do anything? So I think the uh, most of the ways in which our metal is tested in this regard is through consumer choice. And, and the effect of your consumer choices is extremely nebulous and feels minimal. And so the temptation is to go like, this isn't working, who cares, and just give up. And it takes, I think, a lot of intestinal fortitude. I'll speak for myself. It's hard, man. It's hard. And life is already hard enough, even for someone like me who's incredibly fortunate. And to say nothing of people who are in far worse circumstances. So it's just a, it's kind of a pain in the ass. And that's why it's so tempting to not think about it or care about it. Yeah. So touching on this, this frustration, um, in the book you coined this, I think, fantastic term, moral mm. exhaustion. Thank you. Um, and you describe it as... It's like describing how it feels to be a fallible human being who really genuinely cares about being a better person and doing good things, but is constantly making mistakes because it's nearly impossible to be perfect all the time. Um, so could you talk a little bit more about like that term and what drove you to write about it? The reason Ashwin is bringing this up is because I decided when I wrote this book that I wanted to come up with like one cool philosophy term that people would attribute to me. <laughs> And so I, I came up with this term, moral exhaustion, and I capitalized it everywhere to make it seem more important and interesting. <laughs> and, um, and I was really, uh, there's a bunch of jokes about it, about how like, ooh, it's catching on. I am seeing this everywhere. And then Todd May, who's the uh, philosophy professor who helped me with the show and also with the book, read the first draft and he was like, this already exists. It was invented by this person at this time. And I was like, just let me have this man. Just to <laughs> <clears throat> so, um, yeah, like I, the, what I'm trying to describe, which I think is the thing a lot of us feel, is if you if you decide to care about this stuff, um, you realize that it's everywhere. You realize that you're being confronted with moral dilemmas from the moment you wake up to the moment you go to sleep, and everything you do, and where you go, and how you go there, and um, it, it it is truly I find it truly exhausting. Like you think that you have done something, you think you've made a choice that's slightly better than the one you were going to make, and then someone somewhere on the internet will show up and tell you why actually you're wrong, you're an idiot, this is way worse for these eight reasons, and you're, a, you're part of the problem. And it can, that can, makes it doubly exhausting. And so the, the argument I'm making is it's still better to care, and also you have to give yourself a break sometimes. Like Susan Wolf, who's one of my favorite writers, she teaches it at UNC, um, and as I think like a true genius, um, <clears throat> and an excellent prose writer, uh, she has a paper that I love called Moral Saints, and she basically says in much better language than I did, than I used, um, that there's no such thing as perfection, that it's, that it's a bad idea to even attempt it. And uh, there's a wonderful passage where she says, there seems to be a limit to how much morality we can stand. And I think she means both how much we can try to engage in moral questions and also how annoying it is to be around people who are engaging in moral questions all the time. It's so annoying. I, it is a miracle that I'm still married. It's a miracle. My wife has the patience of Job because 
I, when I really was in the depth of my obsession with this material, like I couldn't stop. I, could, I, I was like vibrating at a very high frequency and everything I saw around me seemed like an impossible to solve ethical dilemma. So Sh Susan Wolf and I would both say that um, you can't make everything about ethics or morality because you'll exhaust yourself and you won't succeed anyway. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I think one thing that ties into really interestingly is one of the concepts you come back to a lot over the course of the book and also in the remarks is Aristotle's concept of the golden mean and trying to find sort of the optimal balance of things to care about and qualities of the soul and virtues and attributes to have. And where do you, do you think there's some sort of heuristic for coming to when you know you're caring enough but not too much because it's, it's kind of a hard balance to strike? Uh, I don't think there is a heuristic, no. I, I I think that his point, which is what really appeals to me about it, is this is all trial and error. It's all about aiming at something, missing the mark, evaluating what happened, and trying to get closer to the mark the next time. So, I mean, the, the, the main complaint about Aristotle's philosophy is like, he says, you know, there's a perfect amount of all of these qualities, right? There's a perfect, a mean, a golden mean, a term he never used, but which is attributed to him, a golden mean of uh, courage and generosity and mildness and temperance and all of these things. So find it. And everyone was like, where is it? And he was like, I don't know, uh, but find it. And so it, it can be maddeningly imprecise and unhelpful, but I also still think he's kind of right. I, 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 there, it's not like an alarm bell goes off if you nail it, right? It's like you don't, you don't get a letter in the mail that says congratulations on finding the golden mean of courage, but I still believe that his process is what matters. And it's just, how did I react there? Was I too angry? I think I got too angry. Okay, the next time I'm in a situation like that, I'm gonna back off a little bit. I think I got too hot. Or like, I wasn't angry enough. I saw something happening and I should have spoken out more. Uh, so next time I'm in that situation, I'm going to speak out more and stand up more for that situation. So that's all. That's sort of the best we can do, I think, is is just you just endlessly fishtail toward an impossible to reach goal. Switching gears a little bit, um, a lot of your previous professional work has been in comedy writing for TV, and especially in light of The Good Place, like a comedy show <coughs> that is very directly inspired by moral philosophy and big ethical questions. Um, I was wondering. Do you think there's something special about TV or perhaps more broadly fiction that helps us explore moral questions in a unique way? <clears throat> Excuse me, yes, I do. Um, for the simple reason that I think uh, comedy specifically, but storytelling generally is the best possible uh, delivery mechanism for pretty much anything. Like, um, it has, entertainment has the, um, that the, this, the unique quality of being able to fool people into thinking that they're not being taught anything while being taught things, right? Um, the example I use about this all the time is the show The Sopranos, arguably the greatest TV show ever made. Um, the way that that show was billed in its first season was like, he's a mobster, but he's in therapy. Like, Wah. and the, the poster, <clears throat> The poster was literally, the tagline was, if one family doesn't kill him, the other one will. <laughs> Which is so not the show, right? Um, if any of you have seen it, it's now quite old. Which is, again, I feel like a grandpa. But, um, <clears throat> excuse me. So that show was actually this really fascinatingly nuanced essentially existentialist drama about a man who lived in this like liminal space between life and death and was contemplating like essential questions of human nature. But if the poster had said, had shown Tony Soprano and it said, this show is a fascinating nuanced look at a man living in a liminal space between life and death and it examines the existential nature of human uh, existence, no one watches it, right? Instead, it's like this family and this family, you know? And so people watched that show and they loved the violence and they liked um, talking about who was going to get whacked next week and all that stuff. And then without realizing it, they were, they were shown this kind of incredible 
character study. And uh, it's, uh, that's a, just a good example of the ways that entertainment can bury lessons and, and observations about the human condition within a narrative that is just on its surface entertaining. And be, for that reason, like, it's just the best way to get anything across. And I don't know, I don't know that there is a, would have been any better way to, to explain my own feelings about moral philosophy than a TV show, even though those two things don't at first glance maybe seem like they go hand in hand. That makes a lot of sense. Um, I guess the sort of question that comes after that then is, how to be perfect is really different from a lot of your work in the past, both in that it's not a TV show and also in that it's not fiction. And I was wondering, kind of, why did you decide to write something where you are speaking more directly to the audience? And how does it relate to kind of the different, like, is there a different approach than what you were trying to go for with The Good Place in addressing similar issues? Yeah, I mean, I wrote it uh, because I love the subject. And when I was done with the show, I had this strong sense that I wanted to, like, quite literally write it all down. Like, I wanted to write down all of the stuff that I had read about and what I thought about it. And I, I felt like if I didn't do it right away, I would never do it. So I forced myself to pitch the book right, right before the show finale aired. So like the week that the finale was airing, I went and like forced myself to, to do this because I, I thought that it would be a, a nice document to hold up someday for myself and for my kids and say like, this is, a, this is like a chunk of my life. This reading on the subject and trying to understand it and engaging with it was like a good chunk of my life and now I have this thing I can hold in my hand. And as far as writing it, yeah, it was very weird and hard. Like in our TV writer's room, you are surrounded by eight to 12 very smart, very funny people. And if you get to a point where you write a joke and the joke sucks, you say to one of those people, hey, write something better. And they do, and it's great. And if you're writing a book, you're alone in a like sad room. And <laughs> You write a joke that sucks, and then you say, "Hey, uh, someone beat this," and there's no you're talking to no no one. And there were a couple times actually where I wrote a joke that sucked, and I emailed the writing staff of the show and was like, "Hey, I just wrote this joke and it sucks. Can someone help me?" And like instantly, like eight jokes would come back, and I would get angry at myself for not being good at comedy writing, and uh, I missed it terribly. But also, I did like. When you're a, a, when you create a TV show, you break yourself into parts, and you put part of yourself in every character. So people sometimes say like, "Which character are you the most like, or whatever in a show?" And the answer is sort of all of them. Like, you, you can't help it. Like, you you take parts of you. Like in Parks and Recreation, like I'm politically Leslie No, but sometimes I'm Ron Swanson, and I'm like, "Everyone get out of here and leave me alone." And when you're writing a book, when you're writing nonfiction, and it's in your voice, you're just you. Like it's the it's you entirely, and that was very scary at times. Like I couldn't hide behind a character or a set of character traits that don't resemble me, um, which is what I'm used to. So it was I found it very difficult, but I enjoyed it. It was the good kind of difficult. I have sort of a, a different, more specific question, maybe now. So right. um, today there are some moral movements that gain a lot of popularity and have a lot of public fame. And right now I'm thinking about, in particular, and this is one you mentioned in How to Be Perfect, um, effective altruism. And I think one interesting thing about these sort of movements is that they have a moral component to them and they also have a sort of sociological component to them, and that there are specific people who are affiliated with the movement and become its sort of informal representatives. Who are you talking about? I can't figure it out. Yes. <laughs> Obviously, like, these people are still human and they, do things that are immoral sometimes, and I'm thinking of Sam Bankman free. Oh, yeah, right. Yeah, so I guess my question is, how do the themes of how to be perfect kind of interact with these movements that are sociological in character as well as containing maybe some important and useful moral ideas? Do we judge them in relation to the people who are kind of affiliated with them? I think in general that we should not judge any movement anywhere by its worst members or adherents. I think that's generally a bad idea. I think any political system, any socioeconomic idea, if you judge it by the people who corrupted it the most, then you will come to the conclusion that there's never been a single good idea <laughs> in the history of humanity. So I, I was very bummed out when that thing unfolded because I believe that there is a lot of good in effective altruism. I, it, it started 
basically is a way to say like, hey, if you have a hundred bucks to spend on it to give to a charity, maybe don't give it to like the Red Cross because the Red Cross is great and they do good work. They also have hundreds of millions of dollars of endowment and your $100 doesn't really move the needle. There are organizations that can convert your $100 into like lives saved. And so we're just gonna try to tell you like, hey, if you want to be more effective with your giving, Here's, here are some places that you could give to. That there, what's, there's nothing wrong with that. That's a lovely idea. It doesn't, they're not for, you're not compelled to do it. They're simply trying to help people direct their money if they so desire to places that can make the most of it. I differ with that movement in some ways, partly uh, because like a lot of utilitarian arguments, it, as John Rawls said, it doesn't take seriously the distinction among persons. So if my, if the thing that means the most to me in the world is the LA Symphony Orchestra, if the LA Symphony Orchestra has given me more joy and pleasure and happiness than any other group of people who live in the world, and I have $100 to give, I'm going to give it to the LA Symphony Orchestra, and I don't want a bunch of utilitarians knocking on my door and telling me I've made a terrible mistake and people have died because of it. Like that, I don't, I don't think that's fair. So... I do, but I do believe that that movement has, at its foundation, incredibly noble aims. And so when it gets perverted in the way that it got perverted, and now it has this association with it that is so far removed from what its intended purpose is, I don't want to blame the movement. I want to blame the people who were engaged in the corruption and the fraud. And I think we need to localize it, and we need to di divide the people from the movement because I don't think that they were acting within the dictates of the movement, if that makes sense. Um, I don't know if that answered your question, but I have, I've I've told he lives very close to where we're sitting. Right? Oh yeah. <laughs> Is he here? <laughs> I, don't, I don't see him. He has a, a very distinctive looking gentleman and I feel like I would be able to see him from where I'm sitting. Okay, I think we're good. I, I guess I have one last question before we open it up to Q&A. So if people want to start lining up for Q&A, there are two microphones here and one on the balcony as well. Um, but before that, one last question that I think might be especially helpful in an audience like this, at a university like this. Um, in How to Be Perfect, there's a chapter where you talk about how one's status and privilege can interact with what kinds of moral obligations they have. And I was wondering if you have any last advice for people who are at a place like Stanford, which has a lot of institutional privilege and a huge endowment, it right. can be a great marker for change in social status, et cetera. So this is a very tricky question, but here's where I've landed on this. I believe that there are certain essential basic moral requirements of every human on Earth. We saw an example of this during COVID, I think, when essentially everyone was going through exactly the same thing at the exact same time. And regardless of who you were, where you lived, what your socioeconomic status is, what the situation is in your home country, there were certain moral requirements of you that were pretty simple and didn't require a lot of money or, or status, right? It was social distance, try to wear a mask when you can, be considerate of other people, um, don't jump the line for a vaccine if you don't need the vaccine, right? These are all things that are easily accomplished. That's part of this kind of, if you think of a pyramid, it's like the base of the pyramid is like, we, there are certain things that no one gets to opt out of. After you determine that, Tim Scanlon's philosophy of contractualism is a good way to determine those minimum requirements, right? After that, I believe that moral responsibility scales up um, asymptotically to infinity based on how lucky, essentially, you have been in your life. In other words, how many how many fears, anxieties, pains have you suffered? Many through no fault of your own, but just through random luck. Where you were born, your gender, your identity, your the, the nation in which you live, the stability of the government that controls your laws, things like that. And then within those countries, your status, your job status, your socioeconomic status. Um, and and the, the further up that ladder you find yourself, I believe the higher your moral responsibilities should be. Of course, that is not usually the case. Uh, my remarks at the beginning of this evening 
reference that. It is often the case that the folks who should be the best at this stuff are often the worst, the very, very, very worst. And uh, that is bad. Um, so <laughs> so I, I think that it's the, the trick of this is to figure out what we all have to do. And this is, a, this is where philosophy gets really touchy and, and stuff. And you start using words like should, ought, um, might, could, and, and philosophers will pop up out of nowhere and yell at you for using the words incorrectly. But I think the key is to figure out what we all have to do, and then what we ought to do, and then what we should do, and then what we, you know, it would be good if we did it. And you need to take a sort of constant assessment of where you are in the world and that needs to then determine what you what your responsibilities are and how you spend your time and money and effort and energy and everything else. Thank you so much for all your amazing answers. Can everyone give, a, give them a round of applause? <laughs> for those people. <laughs> all right. So for the last 13-ish uh, minutes or so, um, we'll do Q&A with the audience. So please keep your questions pretty brief but so we can get more questions in. So um, let's start over here. Hi, I hope I'm close enough to the mic. Um, I, a lot of, I guess a big theme that seemed to come up in this discussion was the idea that the world is now very morally gray and you can try to do things slightly right and slightly wrong. But I was wondering to what extent you think an, a person's intentions matter in that sense? Like if someone intends to do the slightly right thing and consistently is picking the slightly wrong one or to if someone wants to harm someone but accidentally lucks into doing the right thing, <laughs> um, like to what extent do you think that affects like their own moral standing? I guess I I, I believe intention matters a great deal. Um, it's another reason that I am not super utilitarian in my own thinking is because they don't care what your intention is. They care about results, not intentions. Kant only cares about intentions. I'm not in that camp either. But I think, again, it's like if you have made a sincere and honest effort to do the right thing and you blow it, that's better than not caring, not having any intention and blowing it, right? Like, I think intention before action is a, is a vital part of the process of trying to calculate how good you are being and how you can be better. So yeah, I think it matters a great deal. And I, I'm very forgiving of people. Or I try to be very forgiving of people who aimed to do the right thing and then made a mistake. I think that's the most human situation that there is, honestly, is like, I tried to do something good and I screwed up. Is um, That's like the essence of life to me. Thank you. Hi, so I have a three-part question. Sorry, everyone. <laughs> How much of a c companion piece should this book be seen as uh, to the good place? Part one. Uh, oh, do you go want me to answer as you yeah, go? Yeah. yeah, yes or no? It, it, it's, it's very much a companion piece. It gets into some stuff that the show didn't have time to get into, but it's very much intended as a companion piece, yeah. Okay, and then the second part off that is how much of a, how would you manage the parasocial relationship now that I am speaking to Michael Schur as, via the book? I don't understand the question. Say it again. So parasocial relationship, I, I will now know you better than you will ever know me. Right. How does that change how I interact with you and or the show? I don't know. Okay, great. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> and then the final one is, what were the challenges in translating the philosophy and the comedy into different languages across the world? That's a good question, and I don't actually know. The only translator I've spoken to is the French translator, who uh, was an incredibly French gentleman, <laughs> um, who was delightful and, like, kept excusing himself to smoke, uh, which was so wonderful. Um, and he, he, I asked him, I was like, was this hard? Some of it is idiomatic, some of it is colloquial. And he said, no, it was very easy. Uh, very, very easy, very easy, very simple. <laughs> and uh, I, I took his word for it, I don't, but I don't know. It, the, the wildest moment, I'll say, was I had to approve at one point the cover for the Ukrainian edition and the Russian edition in the same day. And that was very scary and freaky. And I, I reached out to the Ukrainian translator just to like make contact. And I, uh, I don't, it didn't get through. The message didn't get through. And I don't know why. And it's very scary to wonder why. So um, I would love to talk to more of the translators to see what they thought of translating it. But I, I honestly don't know. Thank you so much. You got it. Um, let's go up here to the spot. 
Hi. Uh, Hi. Thank you so much for oh. being here. Oh, balcony oh, first. So just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thanks for being here with us. This is wonderful. Uh, I'm really curious about your talking about kind of infusing a message into comedy and into uh, entertainment. And I'm wondering how, when you do that, you balance being preachy and trying to tell people what you think is the right thing versus just trying to get them started thinking uh, on the topic. Yeah, preachiness is the is the number one killer of not only of comedy but of um, whatever message you're trying to get across. I think I, I was extremely worried about ever feeling preachy or high horsey or luxury in the show. And the same was true of Parks and Recreation, which was making an argument for essentially civil service or government and the role of government in people's lives. And I, that show probably got a little too preachy at times, I would say. We tried to balance it by having a libertarian be a very lovable and, and good person um, in the show. Uh, but it still did get preachy. And now, sometimes when I watch it back now, I'm like, oh, blew it there. I blew it. Um, but yeah, you, you cannot be preachy. People. Don't I don't like it. I don't like it when people are preachy. I don't like it when I feel that I'm that I'm being um, uh, scolded for whatever it is that uh, the message is trying to get across. So, yeah, if you're a writer, I would that is maybe the number one thing to try to avoid. I would say. Thanks. Let's go up here to this balcony. Oh. We'll get to you. Sorry. Thanks. Uh, hi, Michael. Um, I'm Kyle. I'm a huge fan of your shows that you've worked on. You created a vast array of super interesting characters that have crazy, super different names. Um, but I was just wondering um, what you think would be funnier if you wrote a script, say, for Michael from The Office to be in charge of Michael from The Good Places responsibilities or Michael from The Good oh, Places God. to be in charge of Michael from The Office's responsibilities. <laughs> Wait, I'm sorry. You're saying which would be a funnier situation? Yeah, whichever one you take, you take that one, and I'll take the other one. We'll work it out. Uh, the funnier show is clearly Michael Scott in charge of the afterlife. <laughs> I mean, that is that everything goes sideways real fast. Uh, yeah, without question. But now I'm really enjoying thinking about both of those shows. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, just a follow-up question to that. Did you intentionally name them Michael? Is that I did not name Michael Scott. That um, Greg Daniels did. Um, and I named Michael <laughs> on The Good Place after the archangel Michael, who in the Catholic faith weighs the souls of people and decides whether they're going to heaven or hell. I was with my wife in Paris, and we saw this stone relief above Notre Dame. Mm. It was archangel Michael weighing people's souls. <clears throat> and I was writing the show at the time and just thought, I didn't know what to name him. And I was like, oh, I'll name him Michael. And then <laughs> since I did that, everyone's like, oh, you named him after yourself because he's kind of like the showrunner of the world. And I was like, no, 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 that's not why. And then so many people have said it that now I'm like, wait, is that why? Did I do it? <laughs> so. OK, um, the original question. Also, first of all, um, my name is Catherine. Thank you so much for making The Good Place. I've literally watched it like seven times. And <laughs> especially during when I, I lost my grandmother, that was like a really soothing um, uh, show for me, and so my question to you is, did you process some of like your own grief while making the show? Because I think the show is a lot about grief in the end, at least. <laughs> yeah, cer alert. certainly <laughs> the end, yeah. Um, you know, what's interesting is I didn't. Um, uh, it wasn't, that wasn't the, where it came from. It, it simply came from fault tra tracking the characters, knowing that the, the, about the ending that I wanted them to have, and then realizing that there is nothing in Western philosophy that, is, that I've found that is very comforting when you contemplate death. And there is an enormous swath of Eastern philosophy that is extremely comforting when you contemplate death. And so I said to the writers early on in like the third season that like the show is moving west to east, that we had been firmly rooted in America and Europe and, and had gotten a lot out of that. And then we moved, <coughs> excuse me, we moved through, uh, there was some Ubuntu, there was some African philosophy that was worked in um, in the third season, and then in the fourth season, we moved all the way to essentially Buddhism. So it wasn't for me about processing grief, but it, I, I am always so happy when people say that, that the show and that episode in particular helped them. That's very meaningful to me, so thank you for telling me. Thank you for making the show. Thank you. Hi, I'm Sylvia. Thanks for being here, Mike. 
Uh, you mentioned earlier that The Sopranos, for example, was something that demonstrated how TV on the surface level was entertainment, but on a deeper level, it examined something ethical. Um, do you think as a society we'll ever get to a point where we don't need to trick ourselves into being in actively <coughs> introspective? Um, and do you have any recommendations that are kind of, kind of similar to that? Uh, I don't believe, no, that we will ever get to the point <laughs> where we don't have to trick ourselves. I think um, life is very demanding and it asks a lot of us already, e even the most fortunate among us, it just demands a lot. And entertainment is a place where people go to not think about things. And if you start making entertainment about thinking about things instead of about entertainment with thinking about things hidden underneath, then I think uh, people will not be interested. So I, I, I don't think that's a bad thing, though. I, the storytelling has, since the beginning of time, been about teaching lessons while you're entertaining people. Like, you know, the Odyssey was is a very entertaining story. Norse myths are very entertaining, but they all had lessons for society buried in them that were the point of creating them, right? So, um, yeah, I mean, there's so many great dramas from that era. The Sopranos, Breaking Bad, which is a, a wonderful character study and it makes a very, very dark argument that there is a monster inside all of us just waiting to come out. Mad Men is incredibly philosophical. Like, there's a lot of dramas from that era that I think have really interesting philosophical ideas ber uh, embedded in them. So watch all of them, they're great. Thank you. Let's go up to this balcony. Hi, um, I was just wondering like, if you feel that you gained anything from the, pro like personally from the process of sitting down and writing the book alone versus being in like a large writer's room, et cetera. Yeah, I did. Um, I, I did it in part because I felt like it was gonna be really hard and I think that there's real value I've gotten to a point in my life now where I could have kept doing the thing that I've always done and because I know how to do it pretty well and I have a really good team of people who, who do it with me and, and we're good at it. And this felt really hard and, and um, like it was going to be a pain in the ass and it was and I, that was the reason I wanted to do it more than almost anything else. So the thing I got from it was like there is, I think there's real value in like seeing something, realizing it's going to be hard, and then deciding to do it for that reason. And that, that really made me feel better about myself on the other side of it. Thanks. All right, it looks like we have time for one more question, sorry to say. Um, I'll go up to the, that balcony for the last time. Uh, hi, thank you so much for your talk. Um, I have a question that might be relevant for a lot of people. Um, Stanford is a world of people going into tech and consulting and corporate areas. And I have sort of struggled myself with coming to terms with how the corporate industry can be unethical. And But I've always been conditioned to sort of go in that space, particularly in the Stanford environment, um, because that's just sort of the path for success. Um, so how do you go about unlearning those uh, sort of qualities of success in life, and do you think there's still a space to be ethical in the tech or corporate world? Um, yeah, I'm just curious to hear your thoughts. Uh, okay, that's a lot of <laughs> questions. Sorry. Um, I would say the best way to unlearn anything is to talk to people who unlearned it or never learned it and see what their lives are like, try to get a sense of what value they take out of their work. So if you have been always oriented in one direction, go chat with some folks who do something completely different and ask them why they like what they do and ask them if they find it fulfilling and ask them why they find it fulfilling. And I, I think sometimes my dad's college roommate um, w w always wanted to be a physicist because his dad was a physicist and his dad was a physicist. And so he went to college and he studied nothing but physics. And when he got to like his senior year, he was like, I can't take it anymore. I hate physics. I want to do something radical and different. And he became a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> and it's so funny to me that like his rebellion was he literally he was a partner at Cravath Swain and Moore, like the biggest, <laughs> baddest ass corporate law firm in America. But like that was his rebellion. But for him, that was a rebellion, right? Like that he was on one track his whole life and he took a completely different path. And I think he was very happy. So I think you just need to like, you, you just have to sample the wares of various careers and jobs and talk to the people who are in them. 
and then maybe you'll stumble into a person who's like an who's a, a wide-eyed acolyte of of whatever public service or or a nonprofit or something, and it will spark something in you, and you'll be like, oh, I want to feel the way that person feels. Maybe that's for me. Um, and then you had eleven other questions, and I've forgotten all of them. Um, uh, uh, just one of them is: Do you think there's still space for, oh, for ethics, ethics in tech? tech. Um, yeah. Yes, of course there is. There's space for ethics in everything. You just have to make it. Like it, it doesn't. Um, ethics isn't like, you know, take a three percent of this ethical solution and like, you know, sprinkle it over your breakfast cereal. It's like you have to decide if you are a company that you are going to be a company that strives for ethics in your in your workplace, and you will fail. Like every individual will fail. But you have you. It has to be baked in. You can't. It, it's not a like, we'll donate one percent of our proceeds to charity kind of a deal. Like it involves the way that you treat your employees and the way that the corporate culture works and the way that you promote people and the way that you, the way that you put your products into the world and ship them and market them and everything else. So, it's not easy to do. And capitalism is almost antithetical to the idea of ethics. If as soon as you have shareholders who demand profits. You are at risk of chucking everything aside except for profit, and so it's not easy, and it's not—it's um, a very rocky road. But yes, there is space for ethics everywhere. I believe that. I truly believe that. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Thanks so much. Thanks so much to Ashwin and to Mike. Uh, Mike's going to be now outside signing copies of How to Be Perfect for about 30 minutes just outside. I want to thank you all for coming. It's great to see people in person. Thanks once again, and good night.